This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. I'm tired, I'm exhausted, but I'm hopeful because I have not seen this response in my lifetime. So what are we actually going to do? What are you willing to do? What am I willing to do? Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we ask, what if making academia more inclusive requires not just fixing, but reimagining? Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 136. I'm Joshua Hall. I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Dan, I'm feeling strangely refreshed tonight. What did you do? I left my house. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with this concept. <laughs> I just got back from a trip to the mountains of Virginia, and I saw my family and my parents for the first time in months. That is home for you. Um, did you take precautions going home? Because it seems like you're, you're breaking your quarantine bubble. Well, I didn't see anyone really except my parents. And I was at a, in this remote cabin in the middle of nowhere. So, so hopefully as safe as can be, uh, as safe as is possible. But, you know, I was thinking I, I typically travel, you know, I don't travel as much as some people, but it, I travel a decent amount. And I realized this was the first time I slept in a bed that was different than my own for like three or four months. And I don't think that's happened for a long time. A long time. Normally your spring travel schedule is insane, if I recall correctly. Yeah, spring is very busy, and then um, fall, it, it ratchets back up. And, you know, it occurred to me, I was doing some planning with some folks that work for the fall, and, you know, it looks like all the conferences and all the recruiting trips might be canceled, so I may not be going anywhere this year, probably like a lot of people. Travel via Zoom in your imagination. How about you, Dan? Are you going anywhere? Got any plans no, on the horizon? I, I don't think so. <laughs> I, eventually, I will go home to Pennsylvania, probably later in the summer, but it's going to be quite a while until that happens. So my parents are coming here. That's that's how we're going to navigate this. Oh, and news. hopefully everybody stays healthy until then. Well, that's good news. Well, Dan, uh, speaking of the mountains, I have a beer tonight that is from the mountains. I'm drinking the Wanderlush Hazy Adventure Ale from Highland Brewing Company in Asheville, North Carolina. Josh, I just got to the part of the show notes where it says, show Dan the can, <laughs> and I am very <laughs> nervous. All right, so I didn't want to forget to show you this can. So I almost didn't purchase this beer in the grocery store because I thought it was old leftover beer from the holiday season. Take a look at this can and tell me what it reminds you of. Oh, well, if you if you look far away, it looks like snowflakes on a green field. It looks like white snowflakes on a green field. But if you get close up, it's little dog paw prints. Uh, no, I don't think it's paw prints. No, look very closely. I just saw paw prints. Yeah, you see the white things on the edge underneath the, tra- the trailer? Underneath the trailer. Okay, do you see the little RV thing? Uh, yeah, there you go. Underneath your ring finger. This is great radio, by the way. Oh, there's a oh, little okay. white. Yeah, there. No, that's just one little part of it. There's a dog walking around, but that's the only. Part well, of that's the can. what I saw. You put that part of the can <laughs> up to the screen. Uh, it looks very much uh, like a like a winter seasonal, but it is not. But it's actually really delicious, Dan. It's uh, quite a nice fruity hazy uh, IPA. I feel like this part of the show has gotten super boring because <laughs> that's all I drink. <laughs> Uh, the, the close up showed a lot of summary things. I think I saw a daisy and some sandals and flip flops and things like that. So this is definitely a summer beer that is masquerading as a winter beer. That's right. This is my beer of summer. Now I did want to say that we had a little issue with uploading the episode last time. And by we, he means me. (laughs) Go ahead. And so for some of you who may have been quick to download the episode right when it dropped, the previous week's episode was actually duplicated. So if you happen to be confused and wondered why we were re-releasing the same show twice in a row, you might just delete it in your podcast feed and download the actual episode 135 instead, because I thought it was a good one, Dan. Remind them what we talked about. Yeah, so it was almost it was very action-packed, Dan. It was like a, a two-part... It was like two episodes rolled into one. So we spent the first part of the show talking about some action items that you could do in your own context to 
move from just being a bystander to an upstander to combat racism in your own setting. Uh, important topic. Something we are continuing to think about. Yep. So listen to that if you haven't yet. Uh, but then also, Dan, you did a great interview where we talked to Dr. Andres de los Reyes about his new book, The Early Career Researcher's Toolbox. And he is a faculty member who really took the time to think about how do you really find success being an early career faculty member? Because they never teach you that stuff during your training. Yeah, they sure don't. So if you didn't hear any of those things uh, last week and you just heard a repeat of the previous episode, go back and, and download that. I apologize. Um, and we'll have more from Dr. Dillis Reyes in a couple of weeks. I've got more of that interview to share. Yeah, and, and Dan, we're really excited for this week's episode with Dr. Shala Freeman because I think she has a really great perspective about how these conversations about race that are happening in the United States right now play out and have an impact in academia instead. So she had a lot of great, great things for us to, to think about. And I know she changed the way I thought about how this impacts academia. And I'm excited to share it today. Okay, we will get there very shortly. In the meantime, uh, we do want to take a minute to thank our sponsors. Josh, for the people out there that are doing quite a bit of writing during the quarantine, I know people are starting back to lab, but hopefully you're finishing up a few papers. If you would like to go deep in to writing about science, learn some tips and tricks for communicating your research, you can check out an on-demand webinar from Promega uh, on that very topic. They're going to talk about tips for preparing articles for journal publication, advice for sharing your story in blogs, other publications. I don't know if they do any uh, podcast writing tips, but we could use a few of those. Maybe they give us some for free. Maybe. Go to promega.com slash hellophd and you can find a link to that webinar and uh, view it anytime you have some free time. And also, Dan, we want to say a special thank you to all of our Patreon patrons. So if you'd like to support the show, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash hellophd or uh, click the Become a Patron button on our website. All right, Josh. Well, I think you set up this interview nicely with Dr. Oshala Freeman, and I look forward to hearing what she has to say. I am Ashala Freeman. I serve as the Director of Diversity Affairs in the Office of Graduate Education in the UNC School of Medicine. In that role, I am heavily graduate student facing, I'm providing a great deal of support for our underrepresented students. Part of that involves overseeing our underrepresented student recruitment and being engaged in the admissions efforts, as well as directing our initiative for maximizing student development program, which very largely is a retention mechanism for these students to really foster their success in graduate education and in their PhD programs to, to launch them on to successful careers, not only in the biosciences, but hopefully in bioscience leadership. Another aspect of my job um, is serving as a diversity consultant, working with the School of Medicine's Office of Inclusive Excellence. Um, and that involves really being part of working with our new vice dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion to not only develop and implement the new strategic plan, but also I've been involved a couple of years in, in providing some bias trainings available across the university and throughout the School of Medicine. That's fantastic. And implicit bias is something we've talked about quite a bit on the show in the past. And and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you today was in this specific moment in time where we are, I think those of us who've been involved working directly for diversity and equity inclusion in research, in a research setting, in an academic research setting, We've advocated for certain things for a long time. We've supported students um, with specific challenges within academia for a long time. Yes. But we're at this moment in time where society is opening their eyes in a way that maybe they haven't for a long time, maybe ever. And that flows over into academic leadership at our institutions are maybe opening their eyes to certain ways of being that maybe they hadn't before. So, you know, from, from your description of what you do, you're at the table talking to uh, people who 
make decisions at a research institution. And you also have the experience, one, being a biomedical researcher. Um, you didn't mention it, but I happen to know your background is you were a grad student yourself and you a postdoc and you know, you have that experience and perspective of, of being a trainee, um, but also working with students for a number of years, specifically underrepresented students. So at this moment in time, what, from your perspective, what are some of the things that you think research institutions could, could actually do today over the next year, um, over the next few years? Um, what could they do to actually make a difference? Because I think my fear is that this moment we're in and I'm from the perspective of academia, will be just some flash in the pan. We're giving lip service to these changes that need to be made or this acknowledgement that there are problems that need to be solved, but that nothing will come of it. And I don't want that to happen. So what I'd like to hear is from your perspective, what are some things that, that our institutions could actually do, actually implement that would make a long lasting difference? So I have lots of thoughts, as you can imagine, on this topic. Some of them, I think, are actionable. Some of them are very much about seizing the moment and the momentum of where we are in our society. You know, I, I share with many colleagues, I've, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, but I'm hopeful because I have not seen this response in my lifetime. And I am encouraged that change can happen. I think in many ways we've got to change how we have responded in the past or at least just look back to what we have done or not done in the past and at least don't do that. But I, I think, and these are not going to be in a specific order, but I, I think one of the key things is setting a new priority for success, success for all, success for everyone. Um one of the pieces that I really like about our strategic plan, it, it talks about environments where everyone can thrive and, and really taking that to heart for it to not be some of us, but truly be all of us and, and do the research, be introspective, pay attention and really start to define what that looks like and, and be intentional about identifying the barriers, the barriers that we have in place with regard to success so you mean for everyone. Trying to identify and fix some of the barriers that might be inhibiting the success for some of our trainees. Yes, I, I absolutely believe that. I think a phrase that I have heard a lot over the last two weeks is about being bold, being innovative, and reforming. I hear lots of conversation, and I have learned heard lots of conversations for many years about us fixing these problems. But I think a, a, a really insightful perspective that I think articulated it quite well, at least for me, is that assessing our current scenario, assessing our society, assessing our institutions with regard to, are they broken? And I mean that along the lines of, do we need to change the outcomes? Absolutely. Do we need to change how we're doing things? Absolutely. But is the current structure giving us outcomes that were not planned. And I think some of that involves the, the revisioning, the reforming, fixing something suggests that it is broken and that it is not doing what it was set up to do. And the reality is our institutions were not set up to prioritize difference. We're not set up or created for everyone to thrive. That just was not the specific mandate these things and, and these, these institutions um, were created with a specific targeted demographic in, in mind. And, and I'm, not, I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that broken is not quite the term because I think when we think about broken, we think about, okay, what are the things that we need to fix? And I think this is going to require a, a really unique perspective about understanding that the situation we got here by very by design, and and I think redesign is it's is what's required, and and thus figuring out what are those pieces that we can change in order to generate a, a different outcome. I mean, we are scientists. This is a huge experiment. Um, we can go into it very much informed, but it's not a quick quote unquote fix. It's it's really going to take strategy and effort and work. 
And I, I feel like that's a piece of some of these conversations that I hadn't heard historically that I am starting to hear now. Well, you really have my mind spinning now thinking about, <laughs> thinking about that. Sorry? Yeah, the goal here maybe isn't necessarily to fix the broken machine because if it was, if we fix it so that it's functioning the way that it was designed, that's not doing the things that we necessarily want it to do. So instead of fixing, framing this discussion in the context of uh, reimagining, reinventing, I really love that. So along those lines, let's reimagine together. How, yes. how, how, would, how would you reimagine it? What are some ways we can rethink what we've been doing and, and maybe change some things for the better? At the end of the day, and, you know, bear with me because I've been involved in a whole lot of conversations, particularly recently, a lot of different trainings, a lot of different ideas, a lot of different efforts at the core in Ashala's opinion. And that's all I really care about actually today <laughs> is what you think. Appreciate that. <laughs> at the core of this, it's respectful and appropriate treatment of people. That That's the core and I'm not saying that the world is not perfect. And I understand that that's not going to always happen. But if that is our goal, then mistreatment should be at a minimum. Or at least we ought to be able to identify the mistreatment properly, appropriately address the mistreatment and take action to hopefully curtail that um, mistreatment. And, and so I think largely creating standards of behavior and respectful behavior. I mean, we, we talk about setting expectations, especially for trainees. Um, we have a sense of appropriate expectations for others. Are they articulated anywhere? Are they written anywhere? I think in, are, in are a, they you know, consistent. I, are they consistent? Are they consistent? That's that's a big one. You know, I think about my particular journey, you know, going from undergrad to grad school to postdoc to job, right? And all in the majority of those steps, I was a student. And my work, quote unquote, space was a lab where I was a trainee and a worker, you know, kind of that, that happy medium where graduate students exist. And the dynamic in the lab was not what I would, it's not what happens in corporate America, right? It, it, it's not what happens at my house. It's not what happens in a traditional classroom. It, it's a little bit of a merger, maybe of all three of those places. And then I took a job in academia. Where are the standards and the education of those pieces? I've never had specific formal training around how I should behave, how I should respond, how I should treat others. The lesson and the model is to duplicate what you see. I mean, that's the, the, that's the apprentice model that this whole yes, system is. was built upon. Yes. And the behavior piece comes along with that action piece, whether we like it or not. And, and so in that model, if we are not correcting those behaviors, the, the ones that we don't like, if we aren't identifying, in, identifying and articulating those behaviors and then not correcting them, then they are, they are propagating. And I think that, and that's what we see very much. So, so I think a core piece is being very intentional about our expectations and our standards of behavior at all places, at all levels um, within our institutions. And I think that makes it easier to very clearly identify when something goes well, but also when something goes awry and we can address it. I think one of those core pieces that I keep finding is that in many spaces, the rules don't quote unquote exist. We know the law, but many of those rules about respectful treatment are not as well defined. And I think it's particularly interesting in our spaces. Well, just to be clear too, you you're referring to respectful treatment of trainees by their advisors. No, I'm, I'm thinking about trainees. I'm thinking about respectful treatment of people, of all people. I mean, you know, in some of these conversations that I have listened to recently, online and abroad, you know, we're talking about at the trainee level, staff, faculty, you know, some things that many of us would take as, oh, that's, that's not right. That's not appropriate. You ask the question, it's like, well, what's wrong with that? And some things are black and white, and I, and you know what? That's a that's a very bad example. <laughs> um, some things are cut and dry. Forgive me. 
But I don't think we are really good, at least in my opinion, we are very good in Research One institutions and thinking about being very strategic about our science. What is the problem? What's the gap we want to fill? What's the hypothesis? How are we going to go about changing it? We've not, in my opinion, taken that same step or that same approach to some of the other things, some of the more behavioral things, some of the more social pieces. And I know they're harder, but the reality is that we are human and those things come into the lab with us. And we can't be, do science success, successfully if we are not being successful as humans, if we are not creating environments for the human aspect to thrive. And, you know, we talk about the human aspect as if it's separate from the scientists, but it's not. And yet we, we cr- try to address environments and create opportunities for the the logic, the science, the strategy, the quantification to, to really rise to the top and ignore the, the social behavioral pieces that are a big challenge. And so I think setting the standards are a big piece. I also think bold leadership. I keep saying, I, I keep hearing this word bold. It's hard to push back against the norm. And I think when the expectation and that goal is set at the top, the rest of us have a choice to get on board or take a different train, right? We can become aligned with these new rules and these new expectations or not. And that is a choice. But I think with that leadership and that innovative leadership, that vision, we can very much get there. But I think it requires direction and buy-in from the very top. This is my priority. This is what we are about. And this is what we are going to do. Um, and I and I think then it becomes the responsibility of everyone to work together to, to retool and to understand how the problem came about. So, you know, some of the things that I think about are increasing awareness. Like, how did we get here? What were the structures what was society like? How were these, how were our institutions created? How and why did we establish the structures and the rules and the policies that we did? And thus, as a result of that, how does that look now? What are the limitations that those specific pieces create for other members of our community and other members of our society? You know, I think I think about privilege, right? And I and I, and I'm an African American woman. There are certain spaces that I can go into, right? And I am certainly very privileged, right? I, you know, if I, for example, if I went to my home church in rural Mississippi, um, that is largely it's a predominantly black uh, congregation. If I walk in there, I have history there. I'm a black person. Uh, I'm not going to stick out. There is a a, a great level of acceptance and welcome that I'm going to experience. If you, for example, walked in, I think the welcome would be there, but you'd get some looks. I'd be getting the side (laughs) eye. (laughs) You would. To be fair, I usually get the side eye when I walk in anywhere. (laughs) Well, I mean, you know, I've worked with you a while. I do understand. (laughs) But I mean, you know, and that's just a, a really simple example about privilege that I would have in that space. That, that you would not, not that you could not still go in and, and, and earn some welcome and become welcome and become a part of that community. But initially, there, there would be some barriers. Like you said, you get the side eye. I would have a steeper hill to climb. You would. Absolutely. And I might in conversation say, yeah, you should come on, come with me and da, 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 and it'll be fine. And then we get there and things are a little awkward. And it's possible that I would be completely oblivious to that awkwardness, but hopefully I would recognize, oh, I should have thought a little bit better about this. I should have prepared you for this circumstance. I should have thought about the community that we would have been visiting or entering into in that circumstance. Maybe even been strategic about maybe not going to the church or bringing, bringing a diverse group of folks to enter in that, into that particular scenario so that we all feel welcome. We all have some, some colleagues, um, those who are more like us in that space. So you, you don't feel like that, that end of one or that outlier, right? And, and that's what I mean about 
thinking about awareness in our institutions, thinking about how these structures were created, how the rules and regulations were created, how that privilege was established, and thus who's at the short end of that privilege? Who doesn't have it coming into this scenario? And how do we change that? Because if we are truly objective about the issues and we can truly be objective in our evaluation, we can see, oh, I can understand how this person, a person from this background is going to be successful. So what about everybody else, right? I sat in on a, a webinar, I was going to say the other day, but it was just yesterday because this is only Tuesday. <laughs> and, and they talked about the concept, one of the concepts they talked about was meritocracy. The idea that your advancement, your success is based very much on the skills that you bring. Well, implicit in that is that if you don't advance and you, if you aren't successful, that's because of you and something that you lack. And that's not quite right because if much of the success is really dependent on the experiences and the exposures that you have before you get to this particular place, and if all of the tools that you need for success are not completely and totally bestowed upon you in this place, then your success or lack thereof really is out of your control. And so being strategic and, and utilizing a lens such as that, stepping outside of yourself or outside of ourselves and, and really being thoughtful about what it takes to be successful and how we se select for that or not. Thinking of awareness of what the issues are and where they came from and then how they became embedded in our structures and our policies and our rules, acknowledging that they are real, um, which is a big one. And, and I think that's a, I think maybe that's why we in, in academia have been so slow to either recognize these issues or act upon them because, you know, by our very nature of the fact that those of us in leadership positions have successfully navigated that very system that we are now going to have to admit was flawed or yes. needs to be reinvented or reimagined. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, that I think psychologically that can somehow feel like we're discrediting our own you know, navigation of of that system, either from the perspective of, you know, there's sort of the hazing perspective, like, well, I went through it. So, you know, you have to go through it too. And I hope not many people have that perspective, but maybe they do. But, but then also the, the perspective of, well, well, you know, I didn't have a problem. I didn't experience that. So when you're telling me that's real, I don't necessarily believe you because I didn't experience it that way. And sort of that inability to go outside of ourselves, um, especially those of us who are within academia, people from the majority group in that point of privilege, um, you know, flipping your church example on its head to what we actually are talking about, which is in academia, I'm the one walking in the door who is in initially greeted with instant privilege because the vast majority of people look like me and are comfortable being around me and are maybe saying things to me they wouldn't say to you. So, you know, all of these things we're talking about are very much embedded cultural norms within yes. academia. So moving away from the meritocracy, which I 100% believe, having expectations, and, and actually not, I would go beyond, you know, not just having expectation, clear expectations of advisors, but enforcing consequences when those expectations of advisors aren't met, which is a whole another topic. Uh, but then just generally being a nice person and treating people with respect. I think we agree, and I imagine the vast majority of people who are listening to this would agree, those are all things we should do. Those are all things we should strive for. How do we get there? How do we change? How do we culturally change, institutionally move away from this system that we've had for so long that we're saying is not the right one, or at least is not quite the right one. I, th I think people have this feeling of wanting to act, wanting to do something. W what do you think are ways we can move in the direction that, that we're talking about? I would suggest a couple of things. I, I see the big work as being a longer haul than a quick piece. And when that longer haul takes longer than we expected, we get discouraged. 
Um, and our momentum is lost and we stagnate. And so I think my, my strategy would be having some easier, smaller targets and to, to keep us going and, and keep the momentum while we are tackling the bigger pieces. And so a, a large piece of that is educating. E- educate yourself. We can all educate ourselves. We can all become allies. Some of us can become advocates. Some of us can become sponsors. We can, we can talk about um, what those different things mean, but part of that is educating yourself. We are PhDs. Anytime we have a scientific question, anytime we delve into an area or discipline that is new to us, we read, we, we Google, we go to PubMed, we find all of the research articles, we reach out to the experts in that field to, to learn so that we can understand better and then implement whatever. We're a little less comfortable, I think, when it comes to behavioral change, when it comes to social change. And, and so I think we still need that strategy, but that's the first piece. You can't just ask somebody what you need to do. And, and, I, and I don't mean that in the, in the, in the guise of, with regard to this particular conversation, but it's not just talking to maybe the marginalized people in your group or just talking to the marginalized people in your community. It really is reading the articles, reading the books, learning more about racial equity, learning about microaggressions, learning about bias. There are lots of trainings out there that are available. There are lots of videos out there that are available. I think the first piece is is educating, but then practicing, right? Insert, we all know if we want to be good at something, we practice it, right? We know that that if we stop practicing, we revert and, and habits die hard. And these are generally lifelong habits that we are trying to change. And I, if, if we are thoughtful and intentional with, with those things in mind, I think we will be much more deliberate in our action and, and much more likely for success. So with regard to learn about these topics and then engage, don't stay quiet. One of my favorite new quotes that I heard, I know many people doing this work have heard it for a long time, but it's really not enough to just be non-racist. Right. We want to be anti-racist because there are lots of non-racists around us. And this is how we got here. So what are we actually going to do? What are you willing to do? What am I willing to do? Right. Confronting the bias, confronting the racism, confronting the unfairness or the privilege where we see it, call it out. That can be done in a friendly way. It can be done in an aggressive way. I don't think the aggressive way is necessarily going to always be effective, but there's a time and a place for everything. I think making education in these spaces a requirement in all of our spaces, right? Rudimentary. When I think, I, I believe, I would assume that most places where you are hired, there's, there's Title IX. There are lots of different trainings that are required, right, to, to be successful and to work um, at that particular location. Why is this not a standard, right? Orientation. This education and these pieces, these set these expectations, and then you give the people the tools to better understand what these topics are, what the issues are, and then give some examples of what to do. In some ways, education is a piece but I, I almost, it should be continuing education with, with the side of actionable items, right? So I've read this, I've done this training, I've led this or participated in this group. So what do I do? Well, I need to be thoughtful and introspective about the things that I do, how I say it, how does it impact others? You know, those are some of those things, really being thoughtful about me, you know, Ashala and the biases and the prejudices that I hold. One of the strategies that I've also found really useful is, is to, to have that accountability partner. And it could, it could be, you could be termed a whole lot of different things, but having that colleague, that friend, that spouse, that sibling, whomever, who can call you out when things happen. Sometimes it can be a peer or a colleague in many spaces. Sometimes it's going to be someone who's a little more comfortable with you personally. But I think at the core the goal should be our individual behavior change. 
Because when we increase our awareness and our education and we model what it should be, that spreads. Um, not only in how we act with others, but how others observe us behaving and in getting a good model of how these things should be. I think these topics, racial equity, uh, microaggressions, fair treatment of anyone and everyone should be pervasive in everything that we do. It should not just be a set of rules and regulations that people see when they first start in a space or in a lab or at an institution, but these priorities about how we behave should be reinforced regularly. Another piece is being okay or, or beginning to get comfortable with being vulnerable, right? For people who are marginalized, for individuals who have traditionally been denied success or have not had, excuse me, been denied access to spaces, um, it's, it's really vulnerable. It's a risk to enter into these locations, um, to, to be the only one, to be the conspicuous one, to feel like you don't fit um, and to not know how to, how to fit and to engage in that space. I don't know if I know of an individual who has never had that type of experience. I would dare say that every person who's going to grad school has felt that way at some point, right? But we don't talk about those kind of commonalities. We don't talk about those fears. I'll be, I think it's fair to say sometimes we forget them because depending on how young we are, um, it may have been a while ago, but connecting on in that human space beyond just the research, I think is really critical and important. I, I actually, this reminds me of a conversation and I'll be quick here. This reminds me of a conversation I had with a participant in a training not too long ago. And we were talking about identities and, and, you know, when we talk about identities, those are the things you can't take off and that those, the things that you can't, that they go with you wherever. Right. Um, and, you know, we were ranking them and I just, I'm one of the facilitators, it's my job to share. And I shared, you know, for me, with all of the experiences that I've had and da, 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 I identify quite often first as a, as a Southern woman, because that culture is a, is a big piece of me, a big part of, of me and where I come from. I'm a black woman, you know, I'm a mom and da, 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 I'm a wife. And I went on down the list and this person interviewed, she, if she, she assumed that my first identity would have been scientist. Right. And I do identify as a scientist, but that's not first for me. And you couldn't absolutely see how our priorities might mis be misaligned. Our conversations, our communications might be misaligned just because of that distinction. Um, she identified as a scientist. She is a scientist. She's faculty. She identified first and foremost as a scientist, but it was a little bit lower you know, and, I, and I've given that particular example a lot of thought um, over the last year with regard to how I came into science as a first year graduate student or even as a summer research student when I was an undergrad. And scientist was nowhere near my identity. You know, I was many things, but, but not that. And but what I thought of first and foremost was that I was not of this space. I was n all the things I was not, right? Especially in those different spaces and how uncomfortable that made me, how, how fearful that made me that I was not going to be allowed to remain in those spaces if I did something wrong, if I said something wrong. And I think all of us have had some opportunity to feel that in some space, and, and that's that, that shared fear. That's a commonality that really pervades a lot of things. Um, but we don't talk about those pieces. You know, I think, I think about a student who was shared, you know, think going into prelims and, and the challenges they're in and the fear associated with, with passing the qualifying exam and da-da-da-da. And then having a conversation um, with the research advisor that he failed once almost a second time. And, and this is a successful faculty. And, you know, and, and the student's mind was just blown because she could not have envisioned that such circumstances could have ever befallen her research advisor, right? And, and, 
And we forget about those pieces. We forget about connecting beyond the science. But, but that's where our success, our drive, our, our self-efficacy, our motivation, all of those people in my, all of those things live outside in many cases of, of the science. And, and because we don't connect in those spaces, I think it is an unfortunate disservice because we find so much more that we have in common and that we can relate and that we belong because we share that common theme or whatever it is with the, with the individuals around us. So I think education, knowledge, working toward behavior change, inserting all of these pieces in everything that we do, but being okay with being vulnerable and understanding that we can't know everything and thus we can learn from all of the people around us and engage them. I think with all of those things in place, we implement effective change, but it largely starts, I think, with caring, listening, and being bold with regard to how we can change things. You know, those are really great words. And I think that this conversation has ended up going in a very different direction than I thought it would, because I think what I really thought, I would talk to you and you would say, okay, if we just have the people at the top instituting policy, A, B, C, D program, E initiative, if that all happened, then we would fix it, but not fix it, reimagine it. Or maybe maybe I was thinking about a, a fixing, not a reimagining, but but if I, it, it seems like what you're advocating for, what you're highlighting is a way that we have failed in academia is this failure to just recognize the humanity of the people who are involved, who are doing the work, the relationships that we have with each other, with the trainees, with the PIs, amongst all of us, that we've somehow, maybe because we're scientists, because we've prioritized some sort of cold, logical thinking or something, that we've failed to, uh, you know, really prioritize those relationships and the way we work together, the way we treat each other, and that those those things have value and, and maybe even more value, the absence of that, there's no way we can truly be successful. That's my feeling. And I, and I find that to be, you know, I don't, I don't want to, we're not horrible folks because I'm part of the institution. We're not horrible folks, but, but what we prioritize and what we utilize in addressing a problem, I think sometimes it excludes some really critical pieces. And I know the human piece is hard, is complicated, but I do believe that it is conspicuously absent quite consistently in how we have tried to address some things. Don't get me wrong. I think there are some things that leaders can do, but I think the first part is setting a vision, making it a priority, and putting in place, like you said, when we talked about behavior, consequences or certainly incentives to to be aligned with those expectations and i think when that culture begins to change we can move the needle with regard to re-envisioning some of these things because it's not just an easy fix i don't want people to be, i really don't want people to be afraid of the work i don't want the enormity of the task to be disheartening or dis- discouraging. But it's going to take, in my opinion, some sustained effort to change things because on so many levels, we have not believed that it existed until now. I mean, what does that say, right? When, when we think about the, the history and people didn't believe, you know, and you know, I don't want to get into larger conversations, But the value of an individual's experience, when I say this and this and this happened to me um, growing up, people believe it. When I say it might have happened on campus, it might have happened in the lab, it might have happened a grad student peer when I was a grad student might have said X, Y, or Z, then it's no, they didn't mean that. And, And those are the core pieces that really, I think, undermine the success that we could or can have. So I, I guess to, to wrap this up, at the very beginning, you were talking about 
you know, imagining, imagining an environment where everyone can thrive. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think a lot of the things we've talked about over the last little bit have really been centered around how we might foster or what, a, what an environment like that, what, what an environment such as that would look like. And, you know, when I think about all of the emails we get and all of the messages we get from, from trainees, so many times I feel like the core issue or the commonality among all these situations these trainees are finding themselves in almost boil down to these very things you're talking about where they're being, you know, overlooked or taken for granted or the expectations aren't clear or there are no consequences to their PI's actions and they've repeated these same things time in, uh, you know, time and time again, um, or people just not treating other people well. And I think these things that you're suggesting, you know, certainly have the potential to provide some much needed change and improvement for the experience of, you know, our black and brown and minoritized scientists and trainees, uh, but really, really will make the research environment and our institutions better places for all of us who are who are living and working and swimming around in those <laughs> in those waters. Shala, this has been really fantastic. I appreciate you taking the time to to talk to me today and to, you know, share your your thoughts and words and wisdom with all of our listeners. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity. I hope the words are useful to some of your listeners and they find some encouragement and hope as we move forward in this effort to boldly change our spaces uh, together. All right, Dan, that was my conversation with Dr. Ashala Freeman. Most of what I want to say is thank you to her because I know that in this particular moment, she is probably being asked to explain a lot of things to a lot of people that maybe are thinking about these issues for the first time. And I I know it's exhausting, not only what is happening in the news, but also the needs of people around her that are trying to make sense of it. Um, so again, I just wanted to say thank you to her for, for taking the time to talk to us. You're absolutely right, Dan. I actually know for a fact that she's uh, spending tons of time talking to departments, talking to faculty, talking to groups. And yeah, I mean, my biggest hope is that they honor that time, not just her time, but the time of so many others right now who are just working nonstop to (laughs) provide this information, even though they shouldn't have to. So I hope people honor that time by actually listening and taking action. Um, And and I think we are going to let, uh, let what she says stand. I think she's going to say it better than we have, Josh. But I, I was I wanted to just say that I was really challenged by her comments about how it's not <laughs> these are not simple oh, if we just run a seminar on diversity training in year one, these problems will go away. And that's that's not at all what this is about. What she's talking about is reinventing, reimagining, starting from scratch, recognizing that the way these systems were set up was exclusive and to help a certain group of people. And you don't you don't get onto that other track where everybody is included and everybody succeeds from this track. They just don't connect. Um, we have to start from a different place. And and I, it's I think it's challenging, but I think it's going to lead us to different solutions that we wouldn't have come up with if we thought, oh, we just need to nudge this a little bit. You know what I mean? No, you're absolutely right. And and that's one of the things that we are going to strive to do on this show we're all in this together. And as we've said before, Dan, we think science is important for solving the world's problems. And this is important for science to be the best that it can be. And so in any small way, we can amplify voices like, you know, Dr. Freeman's and we can advance some of these ideas and ways that academia can fundamentally change and be reimagined. Uh, We want to try to do that. On that note, I would love to hear from our listeners who maybe they came in to graduate school as a minority student and maybe they they came in and had a great experience. Maybe they walked into the church and and everybody welcomed them and they had a great time Um, and maybe they didn't. And I think I'd like to hear more voices um, from those people who have faced that challenge and succeeded or failed or whatever it is. But I think we need to understand what it's like to come into this process, not as kind of the the privileged group or the group that looks like the rest of the people in academia, but 
somebody who had to face that uphill battle that you talked about and and how it turned out for them. That I think we need to understand those stories in order to think about what it means to make it different. Well, then, as you alluded to, you know, we want to hear from our listeners um, about this topic and and others that might be on their mind right now. Uh, we know also folks are just starting back into the lab from maybe some time away due to the pandemic. Uh, so we know that can be provide its own challenges too. If that's something you're dealing with, uh, let us know uh, your thoughts on that as well. But if you have other questions or topic ideas, we'd love to hear them. You can send them our way by emailing us, podcast at hellophd.com. You can send us a tweet at hellophd. If you like the show, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We really love your feedback and it helps new listeners find the show. As we mentioned, if you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, click the Become a Patron button, or you can visit patreon.com slash hellophd. We would appreciate the beer money, especially Dan would appreciate the beer money because he doesn't even have a beer tonight. It's gotten that bad. I've got water and carbon dioxide. That's pretty close. <laughs> That's pretty close. But we want to say a special thanks to the ongoing support from all of our patrons. Dan, as always, it is fantastic to spend this time over Zoom hanging out with you tonight. So close yet so far away, Josh. I look forward to the time we're vaccinated and you're back here in the studio again. 2025. We haven't tested what recording through a mask sounds like. Next week on the show, stay tuned. We'll see you then, Josh. All right. See you then. <laughs>